to the History Slam podcast from ActiveHistory.ca. Here's your host, Sean Graham. Thank you, Adam. Welcome to History Slam, everybody. I am Sean Graham coming at you today, nearly live from Ottawa, Ontario, as we prepare for Congress. We'll bookend this show first before Congress, then after Congress. We'll have some stuff from St. Catharines as well. But to start this one off, we're here with two Congress rookies. The man, the myth, the legend himself, Aaron Boyce, who we're all very familiar with from past episodes. Welcome back. Always a pleasure to be here. And another multiple-timer, Madeline Klosky. (laughs) Hello. You actually came to do this in person this time. I know, I know. I'm I'm making progress. It's kind of nice not having to talk into a computer screen to get in touch with you. Oh, but it's the future. (laughs) Then why are we going to St. Catharines if we could do that? I know. One day Congress will be entirely on Skype. Think about that. That sounds sad. (laughs) <laughs> Everybody in their own little rooms. Yeah. <laughs> typing. <laughs> Isn't that our the rest of our lives? <laughs> I know. We have to do that for we should be more more excited about it. Yeah, that. it gives us a chance to get out of our offices and you know go to other places around the country or around the world. And talk to human beings. Yes, interact with actual humans. Oh you don't need that, you just need Google Earth. <laughs> <laughs> uh all right, so the two of you have, have never been to the Congress before. No. Yeah. So this is why we're bookending the show with you two. We'll get your impressions of what you think it's going to be like first, and then after Congress we'll talk again, and uh, we'll, we'll see how your impressions have changed after you've done it. But just going into it, each of you are now presenting, mm-hmm. uh, which is very exciting. So going into the, the event, what do you expect out of Congress? What do you think it'll be like? I know Madeline, you just came back from a big conference over in Europe. So uh, maybe your expectations have changed now after that experience. Yeah, I guess I I expected things to be, uh, with that conference anyways, a bit more chaotic because uh, it too had a lot of people and presenters. But in reality, all the uh, panels I went to, because there were concurrent panels, of course, had, you know, a medium number of people. So it was, uh, other than one or two exceptions, it was never... uh, you know, packed, as it were. Questions were pretty reasonable, and and overall I found it really interesting. The feedback was really good, and the, the wide range of disciplines for that particular conference made it really interesting in terms of the types of questions that were asked. So, And so for, for Congress, you expect yeah. it to be very similar to that? I Part of me is still sort of expecting it to be chaotic, even though I was just proven wrong with this other conference. Mm-hmm. And I guess because everyone here is coming from a historical background, I'm expecting the, the knowledge behind the questions maybe to be like a little bit more specialized because there'll be more people well-versed with the topics that, that everyone mm-hmm. is doing. Uh, so I'm looking forward to maybe getting some more challenging questions and uh, more insightful feedback, I guess, uh, just from that that uh, specialization that I I think these people or these attendees will have. Okay. Yeah. And Aaron? Well, probably along the similar lines as Madeline, just because there's so many different other organizations and associations going to be there. It's not just the Canadian Historical Association. And because of that reason, just like what Madeline said, I, I am walking into this feeling as though there's going to be hundreds of thousands of people everywhere, at least it's going to feel like there are, and everyone's scattering all over the place, mingling and in, in, uh, exchanging business cards, sucking up to other people, and, <laughs> you know, exchanging uh, research and information and everything. All, all the while, I feel lost and insignificant and wondering why I'm here, and am I qualified enough to be presenting, even though... I guess I am because I got they, in. They, they took you. They did, but I still have that uh, that mindset that it's like, I don't deserve to be here, and I'm going to go in there and bomb. And I guess this is really the pessimistic side. I'm yeah. really hoping when we do our wrap up, I'm walking in or walking out saying, "Oh yeah, no, it was fine." But uh, that's how I'm feeling right now. Okay, it's nerves, I guess. But I don't know. Don't all of us kind of have that feeling all the time? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that we're just huge frauds. And but I just feel as though it's a little imposter syndrome. Yeah, which is yeah. totally a thing. But I feel as though it's heightened right now because I have to stand in front of a group of my peers and present my research. Mm-hmm. And now it's 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 now real. It's no longer I'm hidden behind this this uh, facade of oh yeah I'm a grad student I've been working on this research for four years I'm writing this dissertation everything's good. It's I literally have to put myself out there. And mm-hmm. but you still are a grad student. I yes. am. I'm trying to, I know for me, I'm trying to look at this as less of an event and more of a process. And since I too, like Aaron, I'm in the process of writing my thesis right now, like this isn't what I'm presenting is still 
in it's still dynamic it's still mm-hmm. in a state of being influenced by you know various things and so this the going to this conference and, and presenting and getting feedback is part of the process and I'm not trying to look at it as like the definitive you yeah. know yeah, here's right. what I've done no you're, you're it, right it's, it's, it's not, not a it's not a thesis yeah. defense by no. any means it's, yeah it's not as though you have to be prove that you're the expert in this and you're allowed to say I don't know and uh, say hey that's a great idea and I'll look into it further I don't know, the thing that struck me the first time I went two years ago in Waterloo, well, I mean, the Waterloo circumstance was a little different because everything was at Laurier except for the CHA pretty much. Mm-hmm. So you didn't get, like, last year at UVic was pretty cool because right outside in their, in the what I very lovingly would refer to as the big FU square yeah. um, to the rest of the country. Like, let's, let's just put a fountain in the middle of campus and have it run all year. You know what, UVic? All right, we get it. All right, it's Victoria. It's nice outside. All right? That's fine. But there's there's so many people out there, and there was vendors, and there was music and stuff. So it was like, there was sort of that real cool atmosphere to it mm-hmm. that was kind of fun. But at the same time, yeah, you're there presenting your stuff, and there's real sort of academic stuff going on. It was this really interesting dynamic. And that's really what struck me, is that it was more lively and more fun than I expected it to be. Mm-hmm. I thought it would be a dour of just... Sounds like, a, I guess, that stereotypical bunch of academics getting together and... Yeah. Just sitting around and being better than everybody else, yeah. like, yeah. like, and that's not what it was. It was, it was really casual. It was really laid back, and that's what I really took out of it. Well, contrary to popular opinion, academics can cut loose, and I think Congress is probably a a good opportunity for that. And I think I know it's not really what I envision, but I'm not surprised that it's like that. You know, mm. people work hard all year, and we spend so much of our time in isolation. You know, sitting behind a computer, sitting in the archives, then all of a sudden we get to talk to other people about what we do, and I can I can imagine there's a sense of excitement behind that, and and you know it's nice to talk to people that aren't cats or <laughs> you know at least from my perspective. So it's, it's there's some excitement there. Yeah, and it's cool I too. I do that the, in there just for you. I love, I love it. I love it. Uh, <laughs> go ahead. anyone who doesn't understand, go listen to our. Historical anecdote podcast, and that will make perfect sense. Um, and the other thing too is that there's people who, I mean, for for me at least, you know, that I, I studied in Regina and have mm-hmm. now gone to Congress a couple of years. That you, you get to know people from outside of Ontario, outside of Ottawa, who really this is probably one of the only opportunities you get in a year to see them in person. Right. So there's that added element to it as well. That there's this social part of it that has nothing to do with academics. I know for me, I've become really involved on Twitter with following a lot of historians across the country and sometimes interacting with these historians that I've never met in person. And Mm. so I'm also sort of looking forward to seeing these people that I have this sort of digital relationship with in person. And I think that will be sort of an experience. And something that I think only this generation of historians is really experiencing. Because before, you know, email and all this, you, you wouldn't have that sort of weird quasi interaction and yeah. now it's yeah well that interaction would take place in a journal yeah and it, which would come out every whatever two but it's four this six months sort of, now it's every day like, and it's more casual yeah. too sometimes these interactions are more casual more off the cuff and now you get to see these people in person see what their research is maybe meet them and talk to them again on a, a less formal basis and i think that's something i'm looking forward to as well now do either of you look at this as an opportunity to pick up from other people, maybe ideas, methods, or are you there in terms of your work mostly to present and hopefully get feedback? Uh, like, is, is there any draw to you for going to panels in the hopes of picking up some stuff for your own work, or is it going to panels just for the interest of going to panels? Probably both. Well, at least I know for my panel that I'll be presenting on, I'm kind of glad that I'm going last, uh, just so I can see how others approach it themselves. Now, I don't know if that's going to influence how I present it. I may have a fixed idea about how I'm going to do it. But to see uh, my other co-panelists present their ideas first, I may say, oh, well, they did it this way. Maybe I'll shake it up a little bit just to try to keep the audience interested. Or that was a fantastic presentation. I'd really like to follow that. And then any of the presentations thereafter, just to see how other people do it, see how other people react to it. Because this is a, a career path that puts us in front of students all the time. And being able to get, deliver a good and engaging presentation takes a lot of pressure and a lot of practice and a lot of uh, change. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely looking forward to the feedback aspect, but on the other hand, I'm looking forward to seeing other presentations. 
you know, I, I haven't taken a thorough look at the uh, the program yet. I might try and catch a couple that are related to my field of study, but I'm also really interested in looking at things that maybe I don't know anything about or know very little because in this period of writing our thesis, you know, at this point in our career, you could say we don't get a lot of opportunities to learn about completely new things. Mm -hmm. And this I look at as an opportunity to sort of go out of what I'm looking at every day and see what other people are doing. And sometimes things in my experience that you think aren't related at all end up having some really common ties with what you're doing, whether it's in the process or, you know, some type of um, theme, common themes and things like that. And so I'm, I'm kind of looking forward to that side of it, just mm -hmm. seeing things that are different from what I'm doing, almost like a, an academic break, if you will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> an academic break. Yes. Sitting in conference rooms. Yes, but I mean, intellectually, it's it's still stimulating but it's a break from the exact topic that mm. I've been doing and you know we spend so much time working on our own thesis and it's nice to see and hear about something different and maybe stretch your brain in a different way right. than you have been for the, the last however many months years and at the same time it'll be interested or interesting to see people who are there because they want to be there uh, mm -hmm. several conferences are such that when you're an undergrad or, a, or an MA student you're told to go to these presentations but everyone wants to be there everyone is interested in these topics that's why they're at these panels so mm -hmm. that to me also is gonna be very interesting mm -hmm. to just to see uh, the melange of people that are around to see what it's like you know why these people are here uh, what their interests are and yeah it just gonna be really cool because again it's not like a shotgun wedding I mean, <laughs> you, you have a choice to be there <laughs> Yes, you do. Yeah, everyone does have a, have a choice, and you know there there are people who go just to their panel and present, and then that's sort of all you mm -hmm. see of them. And then there are other people who are really engaged and active in it. And it's it's a real mix, and it is a lot of fun for that purpose that there's sort of all these different people who are there for different reasons. And, and it is. It, mm -hmm. I, I think it's it's a good time, and I'm looking forward, frankly, though, to not presenting this year and having more time to sort of go to panels and sort of talk to other people without having that presence of a presentation there. Well, and in that respect, I think Aaron and I sort of both came off lucky because we're both presenting on the afternoon of the first day. So yes. we're yeah. getting it out of the way, and then we'll sort of be in that same position. Yeah. And again, the, the conference that I just attended, I, I had the same situation. I presented on the first day and could just enjoy the rest of it. And yeah, I think that's the way to go. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, actually my first one, yeah, yeah. I did present on the Monday. Uh, I think the Monday morning even. And it was mm -hmm. it was, it was was good. And, and yeah, you get it out of the way, and then you can sort of spend exactly. the rest of the time just relax and having a good time so yeah. I'm looking forward to it I'm glad you two are both looking forward to it Monday afternoon you're both presenting you're presenting opposite each other right uh, we're at the on concurrent panels but not the same panel yeah so we're so it's a, it's a battle to see who gets the bigger crowd exactly <laughs> exactly direct competition I'm very you know odds are I won't go to either because I don't want to pick favorites <laughs> <laughs> so I'll pick a third panel to go to during that session but so we're looking forward to it. I'm leaving tomorrow. You are all, all are leaving on Sunday. So safe mm -hmm. travels down there, and we will see you in St. Catharines, and we will reconvene after the conference. All right, sounds good. See you then. Okay, and now we are in St. Catharines. We have magically moved from Ottawa to St. Catharines just in a second with the miracle of modern technology. <laughs> and we're sitting here with Jonathan McQuarrie from the University of Toronto. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. So before we get into specifically what you do and what you've been doing here at, at Congress, uh, you were at the Berks this past weekend, which was at the University of Toronto. Uh, you were there helping out with some of the organization. Mm -hmm. and it was a massive undertaking. Mm. And now you're here at Congress and you presented yesterday. Mm. I'm just wondering from your eye, what is the major difference between the Berks and here? Oh, goodness. That's a good question. I mean, I suppose the Berks was so uh, very impressive because it draws from a very international, like highly high international audience. I think something that maybe the CHA would aspire to. That, but, I mean, the Berks, there's so many American historians, a lot of Latin American scholars, European scholars. So it was a very much a, a, a more international flavor. Um, not to say that the one here, you know, like there are lots of American scholars as well, but just different focuses like that, which kind of, I think, can give it a little bit of a, 
a different focus, a lot of different sort of historical traditions coming together, et cetera. Whereas here, it's a bit more social, right? Like, a lot of people right. know each other. It's a lot. It's almost mm. like you just sort of walk down the hall, like, oh, hey, oh, hey, I haven't yeah. seen you in ages. Whereas yeah. I think the Berks, it's a lot more like, oh, we're meeting for the first time. Oh, I read you in comps, and I'm mm. really, you're really excited, impressive, you know? Mm. So, different, a little different feel socially, too. Yeah. yeah. It was just really strange, too, because the first time I came here, that was my impression of this one. Is there, yeah. Like, it's so big. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Like, what's, wow. And, and then you go to the Berks, and you're like, oh, my goodness. The Berks like <laughs> five times as big as this. Yeah, yeah, At yeah. least the CHA part of this. Yeah. And, yeah, it's true. And, and you come here a couple times, and you do see people over, yeah. like, over and over. And there's a couple of people who this is the only time you actually see them in person. Yeah. Which is kind of fun, and it's yeah. always nice to see people in, in, in person. And I think what helps here, too, and this isn't to disparage the Berks at all, but... Uh, the way it's set up, and it seems to be set up this way every year, is that at least with the CHA part, they put the association sort of together, mm. right? So mm-hmm. all the rooms are together mm-hmm. between sessions. You sort of mingle with people. Mm-hmm. And, and mm-hmm. So it is a little easier in that respect, whereas yeah. with the Berks, you're sort of all over campus, and which is necessary because it's... Because it's huge. It's huge. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Your research, specifically you study tobacco. Yes. And not, the, not necessarily the smoking of it, no. so much as the growing of it. Which I find really interesting, uh, and having been down to the tobacco region of Ontario mm-hmm. when I was a kid, uh, we played baseball down there. So we okay, yeah, makes sense. Through and, uh, what what gets you? What got you interested in studying tobacco? I think the main reason I kind of came into it backwards. I have to admit because I was really interested in the smoking of it to begin with. I got really I did a couple papers on you know like people smoking tobacco, cigarette advertising, and this sort of thing. So like but, the Jared Rudy style. Yeah, exactly, like, Jared yeah. Rudy. There's a lot of really great uh, Sharon, Sharon uh, Cook. Cook yeah. who, so I just came out of a panel yeah. where and Jared was in the audience and Sharon and uh, uh, Professor Robinson at Western gave a really good talk. But then I started to think, as I did more, more more research, I come from a fairly, I come from rural British Columbia. Not exactly <laughs> tobacco country, but still, like, gives me sort of a background. And I, I always like to think about, like, farmers or, like, rural connections to all this. So mm. I kind of got more and more interested in thinking, you know, like, well, what's, you know, how did, how did these <laughs> cigarettes come to be? Right. Who made these cigarettes? You know, like, once it... Once, uh, once it got to the manufacturer's hands, you know, where all, and so I kind of started thinking about that more, and started to find, you know, there's quite a bit of stuff for it in the states, but very little written about it in Canada. So I thought, you know, there might be a story there, and yeah, I've, I've found quite a bit of quite a bit of uh, material of, uh, you know federally uh, so I got to look at federal archives which I think is really cool I mm-hmm. love I love thinking about the state and yeah. agriculture so got to think about corporations got to think about farmers so yeah it's kind of a backwards roundabout I wish I had a better story like I grew up on a tobacco farm or my great but I, I know I've seen at least three books on tobacco that start with that like you know like my grandfather was a tobacco farmer and then my and I don't quite have that nice clean one but yeah. you know yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> sorry that clean yeah that nice yeah. clean tobacco yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, have have you ever looked at have you been looking at companies in particular I know you talked yesterday about imperial tobacco yeah and specifically the one time I engaged with a tobacco company my dad had this found this advertisement I can't remember where he found it but he found it and he asked me like is there a way to find out what this is and what it is and we found out which company it was. I don't even remember which company. And I called them to ask. Mm. And they were not helpful no. at all. <laughs> right? so, so have you come up to that roadblock with yeah. dealing with tobacco companies? Yeah. I mean, we're a bit fortunate in tobacco because with all the different lawsuits, especially in the States, they've been forced to release some of their stuff. But, yeah, I mean, when I phoned Imperial Tobacco of Canada, they were not super excited no. or interested to talk to me i mean i the, i do know i mean jared rudy who you mentioned he was able to get access i think maybe if you're a bit higher up in the ranks or a bit more pushy than i was about it you you can get into their material but um they're a little bit reticent about that which has made kind of made me go a lot more in the state direction because whereas i, I don't have a ton of corporate archives there's so much state and there's so many uh, files and, and documents just in the, in the, in the Ontario and, uh, and in, uh, Ottawa right. alone that you can really paint a lot of the story from those sources as well. So, and yeah, they have like, there, there's some really great, there's some really great databases like tobaccodocuments.org and these online databases, which basically these huge dumps of documents that 
the, a lot of the big tobacco companies that even though they are based in the states, they might have to they operate in Canada or they have Canadian subsidiaries. So you can find a lot of stuff through there. So yeah, you kind of ways to work around yeah. <laughs> the blocks. Now structurally, when these companies have the tobacco, uh, these fields. Are they buying it from the farmers, or do they own the fields and hire the farmers as employees? Now, usually it's farmers who own this. So what often happens is you might have a large farmer, uh, like a farmer who um, has several farms under his control. And that farmer, they, they would, they would, at that point, they'd call them plantations. So, you know, the, for example, there's like the Windham Plantation. I think that was a total of you know, 10 or 12 farms sort of in the Norfolk uh, area in Norfolk mm-hmm. County, and um, they would then hire tenant farmers to or, uh, to farm plots of that land, and they'd hire managers to right. to manage it. So Imperial tended to, and the big companies tended to work a bit more indirectly through those sort of plantations. Mm. But they often tended to have cozy, close relationships, and people would move between them. Right, like maybe you're in a, a buyer for Imperial for a while, and then oh, you go over and you can manage a plantation. Right. Yeah, right. so. And is there a tangible difference between tobacco in terms of its taste or the process through which it's made, Ontario tobacco and, say, Virginia tobacco? Oh, <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, like, like, I, like yeah. I understand because maybe there is. Like, I don't know. I yeah. mean, it's the same thing with, like, apples. People say, like, if you have an Ontario apple versus a East Coast apple, like, yeah. it's all different. I mean, I can't, but uh, maybe, a, maybe. A, someone who really knows about same thing with wines. Mm-hmm. You know, if it comes from Peely Island, the people can taste it, apparently. I mean, yeah. I can't. <laughs> so is it the same thing with tobacco? Like, is there a big difference? Like, is there something distinctive about Ontario tobacco? Yeah, well, it, the funny thing is that Ontario tobacco producers went to great trouble to insist that there wasn't. Mm. Which sort of implies that there wasn't. Yes. Because yeah. um, the issue was that Virginia, I mean, as uh, you know, you say Virginia tobacco. Virginia, you know, is immediately associated with tobacco yeah. or that sort of Virginia flavor. And Ontario farmers who are raising tobacco for cigarettes desperately for years had to try to assert that Canadian tobacco is just as good at, had the same characteristics, that same light, easy smoking flavor <laughs> that the Virginia cigarette, uh, uh, that, that Virginia bright tobacco would give you. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I mean, there was a bit of a difference. That One of the, the, the criticisms that could be levied against Ontario tobacco is that it was too harsh, that it was too strong. Mm. And so it took them quite a long time. I mean, uh, they started these experiments in 1910, 1920, and it took them another 10, 10 20 years to manage to overcome, for the most part, that stigma that was associated with Canadian tobacco being too harsh, too strong. Mm. So, yeah, there, you're, there absolutely mm. were, like, differences that the seasoned <laughs> cigarette smoker might have detected yeah now you you were on a panel yesterday uh, like you said with mike Camito mm-hmm. and mark Kuhlberg. Cool. so it was this environmental history panel mm-hmm. and all of you were talking about sort of the, the commodification of things that are grown mm-hmm. i mean if i put it in the broadest yeah. possible terms <laughs> we'll sure. put it that way I, i'm just wondering how did that panel come together did you was that a proposed panel or were you yeah. all put together? And, and if it was a proposed panel, uh, when did that process start and who approached who? Yeah, well, here it is, the power of Twitter. Mike Camito mm. sent out a tweet saying, I'm looking for, uh, I, we have this idea about environment and commodity. Anyone doing something on that want to, you know, get so, <laughs> that would be a very <laughs> great story. There and there it is. Yeah, yeah. I, I tweeted back, but it speaks to, I mean, a lot of academics, especially younger ones now, they're sort of talking about the power of Twitter. It's yeah. like a, great example of it right there it was mm. simple as a tweet and i thought and we sent a few emails back and forth just making sure that we were kind of indeed on the same page sure. and yeah and sure and no it's, it's yeah. true the power of twitter is, <laughs> we posted this morning the, when we're recording this we posted the podcast we do with eve Fernet today this morning mm-hmm. so i woke up and by the time i turned on my or paid attention to my phone that had been tweeted and then retweeted a bunch and sort of like yeah like, and so my the the mentions feed or whatever it is yeah. just was like exploding like more, more so than normal I think part of it too is because more people are active on Twitter during Congress yes so a lot of people who are here sort of tweeted it who normally either don't actively participate or just read stuff so it's like so you can see it right mm-hmm. like yeah things, and that's not to sort of champion this show but it's yeah. just my example as well sort of the no, power yeah. of it yeah 
So you guys put together this panel. Mm-hmm. Uh, you show up. Now, I'm, I'm curious for everybody because I think everybody uses conferences differently. Mm. For you, what is the benefit of pre- presenting at a conference, especially a conference like this? I, think, I guess there's two things. One is to sort of, I mean, in my case, this is something that I had done a bit of rough writing on, and it sort of isn't. So it's a way to almost just test and confirm that some of the ideas I have that are already in a chapter make sense to mm-hmm. a wider audience, like stuff that makes sense to me sort of because I've been working on this for more years than I care to <laughs> think about, you know, makes sense to other people. So then when I, when I share it with other people, they're like, oh, yeah, okay, like that, that seems fine. And, of course, you're always looking. I mean, I got a really a couple of really good questions, actually, yeah. out of this one. I got two really useful questions that made me think about things that I hadn't thought about. You know, as someone recommended, I needed to push a little bit more and get out and learn mm-hmm. a bit more about fertilizers and chemicals, which is true. I always do. So, yeah, just just it's a good way to identify the holes in, in your, mm-hmm. your research and, and just as well as checking to make sure that, for the most part, what you have in mind is sound. Right. And I find that that's a useful yeah. exercise. Yeah, sort of an opportunity to workshop the material. Yeah. Right? It's almost like the way I framed it to somebody once, and I don't know if it's a really good way to frame it, is that <laughs> like comedians go into the smaller clubs yeah. <laughs> to do some stuff just to see it works before they take it out on tour or go to a big room. I kind of feel the same way here. Yeah, that's right? a good analogy. You, you test it out, <laughs> see what works, and then you put it into the larger forum. Right? Yeah. Which, to me, that's just sort of... Because this, like, a conference presentation now... Granted, we're recording a lot of them. To a certain degree, it's ephemeral, right? I mean, you present it, and then it's sort of out in the ether, and then that's it. Yeah. And, you know, if you say something wrong, okay, fine. That However many people in the room might recognize that. But, you know, in the context of understanding that this is a chance to work out stuff and see mm-hmm. what works and see what doesn't, I mean, it, it seems to make sense. Yeah. So yeah. for you then moving forward, you said this is already stuff that's in a couple of your chapters. Now, does this give you the opportunity then to revisit yeah, absolutely. Because yeah, these were both um, drafts that you know I've been working and playing around with, and and so it gives me a chance to go back and refine a couple of the arguments I have in it. So then when I go forward in the future and submit this, it'll just uh, those chapters I hopefully will bear further scrutiny, and then uh, yeah, and then it should uh, ease up those holes. And yeah, and also it, it also can give you some sense of you know is this anything that you could later think about publishing you know and right. and, and you always want to be pushed on stuff that you're thinking about publishing because mm-hmm. goodness knows once you go through the publication process yeah. you're going to get all the pushing you want. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So, yeah, uh, and, and then just finally you know this is Tuesday of Congress we're still sort of halfway through here sort of just now for you now that you presented yesterday and now you're sort of you're obligations are done <laughs> yeah so what does the rest of the conference look like for you yeah i mean mostly just uh, i li- i really like just going to panels and just hearing what people have to say the the, the new research I, I was really lucky this afternoon to have a, a panel exclusively devoted to cigarettes right smoking i also something i like to do too at congress is you know a, a lot of friends and acquaintances um doing presentations i think it's as important as important as like the academic stuff is i think it's also important to just go and lend moral support to yeah. other young scholars like and you know just mm-hmm. reinforce them give them feedback tell them they did a good job yeah. you know what i mean like i think it's really important to yeah. to show up to that sort of stuff too mm-hmm. and not just be in it for your own right yeah. Yeah. yeah well it's part of the collegial atmosphere <laughs> yeah exactly right? to go, yeah. exactly so. And so now this is your, by tomorrow, it might as well, your seventh straight day of conferencing. Woo. <laughs> um, when is the next conference that you would even be so inclined to think about going? Because for me, I figure it's got to be at least four months or something. Yeah, no, I don't, I think, you know, I think this is pretty much it for yeah. most of the summer for me. I think yeah. there might be a, a work, small workshop coming up at mm. U of T I'm supposed to go to in a month or two. But yeah, no, yeah, I think yeah. I, this summer is all about writing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cool. So, Jonathan McQuarrie from the University of Toronto, thank you so much. My pleasure. And we've made it back from St. Catharines. Now, we're not back in Ottawa, but we made it back to Georgetown, Ontario, which is where I grew up, and we're at my parents' house. We're in the backyard. This is actually the first time we've recorded any part of the podcast outdoors, which is kind of exciting for me, because if this is successful, I think we'll do it more often. Uh, and if it's not successful, we'll never do it ever again. But we're back <laughs> with Madeline and Aaron who we talked to before the conference, and now the conference is over, we're going to get their thoughts and see what how different it was from what you expected. So, Madeline, we'll start with you, maybe. You had your conference before this. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're still a little jet-lagged coming into Congress. 
but you had your Congress experience, you presented. What was it like for you, and, and how did it differ from maybe what you expected? Uh, well, I definitely expected, as I mentioned before, for it to be a bit of a, a flurry of people, and I think it even exceeded my expectations in that regard because I forgot to take into consideration the Congress beyond the CHA. So, yeah, the, just the fact that there were people everywhere, and I mean, as historians, or at least me, I spend a lot of time alone, so that was <laughs> that was a nice change, but also an exhausting change. So I think uh, I know we were commenting earlier how we're all pretty beat. So that was probably part of it that lived up to my expectations. I was really impressed with how many people showed up at all the panels I went to. Um, previous conferences I well presented in the the one previously before this, and other conferences I've attended have had far less consistent attendance to each panel and that wasn't a problem here so I was very um, impressed by that mm -hmm. uh, another thing was I realized that well I probably people probably should be very conscious of how long they speak but people <laughs> didn't really seem to be very conscious of uh -huh. how long they were speaking so that was something that I had kind of stressed over going into the conference and I know Aaron you mentioned it as well but it definitely didn't seem to be something to stress about, at least other people didn't seem too concerned about it. So that was kind of interesting. And I mean, overall, it was a really, uh, it was a positive experience. I mean, I learned a lot. It's definitely a learning experience in terms of what I would do next time, maybe what I wouldn't do in terms of my own presentation and just getting lots of feedback. Very, uh, yeah, it was, it was really a good experience. Hmm. And that's something Sean Karaj in the session today on media made a joke about mm -hmm. the length of presentations mm -hmm. and how the 20 minutes wasn't necessarily adhered to all the time. Yeah, exactly. And Aaron? Uh, well, obviously the listeners will hear that I really went into it with a lot of doom and gloom thinking that uh, I had the, that, that imposter syndrome going on and that I was going to bomb my presentation. Uh, but once I got there, at no point did I feel like an imposter. I felt like a welcomed uh, member of the CHA and the Canadian historical community as a whole. Mm -hmm. uh, like Madeline, I truly enjoyed all the people coming out to the presentations. I sat in no a number of panels. I thought they were fantastic. Um, a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of topics going on. Um, I really enjoyed listening to the presentations, especially in my own panel that I took part in. Uh, we were able to share some ideas, even though our topics were 100 years apart. There were things that just transcended the decades and transcended everything like that. And so that was really interesting to, to hear, obviously, what other people were doing. Um, and then, like Madeline as well, the whole size of Congress as well, just seeing people everywhere at all times kind of took me, took me aback because I wasn't expecting that many. Again, I went in with no pre-expectations, but uh, that, was, that was just something unique. I know for me the first time that I went to Congress, what really struck me in terms of the size was just walking into the gym the first day for the registration yeah, and getting yeah. your pass and just sort of realizing <laughs> this is this is this is maybe real. What well, the lineup, especially when we saw it on Monday morning and uh, with the row upon row of all the different university presses that were there, yeah. that was that was I think at first a little intimidating. Um, but again, once once I got my pass and started wandering around a little bit more, I felt more more at ease. Well, and I think once we kind of separated from the main Congress building and went over to where the CHA events were primarily held, and you start seeing people you recognize, you start seeing names that you recognize, putting faces to uh, the names that you've seen but maybe uh, never met the actual person, like all of a sudden then it became a lot more uh, familiar, I would hmm. say, and less overwhelming because it's... It was it was a more uh, it was a smaller but it was a more friendly environment too. Yeah, and, and at least with the CHA stuff, you're sort of all put together in the one mm -hmm. building, and everything yeah. was right there. So even though there weren't breaks on Monday afternoon, for instance, there was still sort of enough time to sort of talk to people in between. Exactly. Panels. Well, yeah. there wasn't enough time to talk to people, but there was an opportunity to, to say hi, yeah, a quick hello, and at least make plans to catch up later or chat yeah. later. So. Yeah, which I did with uh, Jody Nurse, and never actually. We never saw each other again. We said, hey, we'll have to catch up later. We never did. So my apologies to Jody Nurse for that. Uh, I'll send her an email later. Now, for the two of you, uh, and you, you touched on it briefly, but your presentation experience, mm -hmm. both of you presented for the first time at this event. And I'm, I'm just wondering if you got out of it what you had hoped you would, whatever it was that you had hoped you would get. 
I, I know from, from my end, I definitely got a lot of the feedback I was hoping to get. In terms of the presentation, I wasn't nervous up until I gave the presentation and then all of a sudden I got very nervous. And so the delivery wasn't quite as probably where I had hoped it would be and where it was at the conference I presented previously. But that being said, n one of the great things about CHA and about presenting in front of historians is everyone understands and nobody made me feel you know, bad or, or whatever because maybe I had a hiccup or something. And so I really appreciated that. And in terms of the questions and feedback I got afterwards, uh, it was really helpful, it's thought-provoking, and I've already written a bunch of things since then um, because I've had a lot of ideas, that fresh ideas that came out of that interaction. So mm -hmm. I, like Madeline, was feeling really good about uh, my presentation, or at least what I thought I had for a presentation until about five minutes before I was supposed to stand up there. And then, <laughs> then, I, then I got the jitters and then I got a little nervous thinking to myself, oh, do, do I know what it is that I'm talking about? And I know that at home I practiced my presentation three separate times. And each time I finished it around 19 minutes. So I thought that's perfect. On my presentation date, I did it in 14. So, yeah. <laughs> so I talked a little bit too quickly. But the questions that I got at the end were great because it showed, that, showed me at least that the topic that I presented made sense. And it's not out of left field. It's not some crazy intellectual endeavor that escapes, uh, or sorry, is, is so minute that it's such a niche um, that everyone can kind of jump onto this thing. And, and that was really appreciative uh, for me, just reaffirming that what I'm doing makes sense and that people can understand what it is that I'm trying to present. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that I had only nine people in the room was quite nice because it, it was like giving a presentation mm -hmm. to a small group. It wasn't giving this huge, massive keynote address to 300 or so people, which, I mean, I've stood in front of that many people before, but never in this circumstance. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of yeah. nice to start small. Mm -hmm. And the thing, too, that I've noticed, the two years that I've presented at Congress, one year it was a pretty good crowd of maybe 30. The second year it was like four. And the group, when it was only four, almost seemed, I, I, I got almost better feedback. Mm-hmm when it was the smaller group because the Q&A wasn't so much Q&A it was more like a group discussion it's a co it becomes more conversational yeah. that's what, and that's how I felt that it was after my panel I had about 9 or 10 people same as Aaron's about the same size and it was really conversational and I think it leaves more time to address certain questions more in depth than when you have a bigger room full of people and everyone wants to answer a question but you don't necessarily have the time to like properly deal with mm -hmm. each one and I thought, the, the other thing I wanted to comment on is I thought they did a really good job of putting the panels together. I know our panel, for example, was, uh, both of our panels, we were really uh, well put together with uh, people that were doing similar work. Uh, so uh, the panels were really well put together. Like the people on our panels were doing the, the very similar and complementary topics to one another. So that really helped liven up the discussions following the presentations as well. Of course, it's not just about the academic stuff. There's mm -hmm. also the, the social aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And again, my first time, it was a very intimidating experience for me to see all these people who you recognize their names but have never met before and, and to try and go talk to them mm -hmm. can be intimidating to a certain degree. So I'm just wondering how the two of you felt about that aspect of it and the, the social part of it. And I put this in the context of Aaron Boys sitting to my left, making Madeline Klosky wait 40 minutes at the car as he tried to smooze during Cleopalooza. So I'm just wondering, the social stuff, I'm just wondering how you, got, how you found the social part of the, the um, event. Well, I'm the first to admit that I'm one of the most awkward people I know. I, I'm fully comfortable embracing that quality in myself and it was nice in a sense that a few of the people I talked to that I had looked forward to talking to and had the opportunity to talk to uh, we were obviously kindred spirits in that respect <laughs> and it was it was nice to feel that that's a, a common thread amongst some parts of our community mm. uh, and I think that's an important thing too because a lot of the times we read these uh, written works and of course being historians doing what we do everyone is so coherent and articulate in the written word and sometimes you meet people in person and verbally I know myself as well uh, we don't quite match up perhaps <laughs> as we do on a textual basis so I actually really appreciated that because it makes sometimes these people that you hold up on a high level and think oh this person they've done this work you know it's amazing I aspire to be like them 
and then you meet them and they're real people and I, I really appreciated that. Mm. You gotta cut me some slack. It was my first time. Come on. It was also forty minutes. We also it was also forty minutes after we said we would meet her. You also said that you'd take some of the slack for that. I would just like to add, while I'm not gonna give Aaron a hard time, and this is in no way related to what Sean just said, but during the same period of time which Sean is discussing, there was a pretty large thunderstorm while I was waiting right. at the car. But we did, we did give you the keys. I know. <laughs> yes, that, yeah, we didn't make Madeline stand outside by herself. Despite Let, let's what that, that story really sounded like. Let's make that clear. Because <laughs> clear implications of that were. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but as, as for the social aspect for me, uh, like you guys, again, it was really cool to see, to put a face to a name, to see what these people look like, what their personalities were like, seeing how they presented and whatnot. It was great to see... Uh, some people who I hadn't seen in quite some time uh, and, you know, reconnect with people. And it was, I, I remember talking with you, Sean, about it as I was walking away. I was able to talk to one of my former pr- professors at Trent, whom I had as an undergraduate student in my second year, and he still remembered me. And that was really cool to think that uh, it, after all that time had passed, that professors do still remember mm-hmm. students. So that was uh, that was really nice. Uh, obviously, I waited 40 minutes again to get in there and talk to them. And, <laughs> Uh, his advice to me is just barge in there like you own the room. So Elbows up. Elbows up. Elbows so I'm going to do that next time. Yeah. But uh, as a rookie, I, you know, I felt as though I had to be initiated in and, you know, pay my dues. So I wasn't quite there yet. <laughs> it was fun to watch. I'm glad you enjoyed <laughs> it. Say. Yeah, I will, I will lingered. say I'm sorry that I, I ducked out what I did because I, was I, just I wish there. I would it's have seen It's not as though I did anything. <laughs> you just sort of lingering. I did. <laughs> five feet away. It was great. You, you should have introduced me to Ian okay. Mosby at that time, but no, you just kept yammering away. I thought you were going over to talk to him when I was talking to Ian. I was. And then I waited. <laughs> uh, Aaron Boys, the CHA lurker. <laughs> I said that. I said I was standing there like a goon for 20 minutes, and uh, thankfully Dimitri just laughed at that. Yeah. Now, both of you have traveled for conferences before. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm wondering, it's 2014. Telecommunications are, are rather easy to do. Well, having been to now these conferences... Are we to the point where perhaps they're starting to become unnecessary and we can achieve everything through telecommunications, video conferencing? No. I think there's something to be said about having that human interaction. It's a lot to take in. There's a lot of people, and Madeline and I commented on it a couple of times. You get conference fatigue just because you're around so many people at all times. It's, it's somewhat draining, but... Yeah. It's so rewarding as well to be able to go up to someone and shake their hand and introduce yourself and talk to them. It just, I think it's really, really cool. I think the, uh, the video conferencing would be really a neat idea if, say, uh, the person was on the other side of the world but really wanted to give a presentation. Well, we've got the technology to be able to Skype them in, say, into their session. Mm-hmm. But as long as it remains uh, something that people can get to here in Canada, then I think we should continue to do it because I really enjoyed my time. And also, I mean, it was here in it was in St. Catharines, so not too far. It's still in southern Ontario, but it was kind of nice to get away from Ottawa or get away from my own stuff for a little bit and just you know get away and see a new part of the part of the country. I guess I can see what Aaron's saying, and I do agree with some of that the the person to person and and sort of in-person community aspect is is not easily replaced but i think there are some things that you know telecommuting uh could bring to the table i know one thing is that congress uh, and the cha it's an expensive endeavor and not everyone can afford to go Um, and there are funding opportunities available but it's not necessarily there for everybody and some grad students have limited funding and i uh, you know, we were we were pretty good and able to manage this trip, but there were some things that ended up being quite expensive, like food, et cetera, which mm-hmm. was a cost I hadn't necessar- necessarily anticipated. And I think that participation, if it was a teleconferencing thing, might actually increase because of that, which is good because you're getting greater participation, but at, it might also perhaps make the conference somewhat unwieldy. Right. Um, but it would also allow people who maybe aren't presenting to participate in the presentations that are happening and being able to see this work without 
having to make the expensive trip from whatever part of the country to mm -hmm. to here. Yeah, I, yeah, I think there's sort of I, there is value in the human part. And one of the things that I I enjoy at these conferences is meeting people in person who I only know through either Twitter or email or whatever. Internet, yeah. Right? So it's kind of fun to do that. And, and I think there could be a very real argument that the work, the best work that is done, or in terms of mm -hmm. maybe planning future stuff, all this, is done outside of the sessions. Mm -hmm. Right? Some of the more productive stuff, and at least for me this week, some of the more productive stuff that I got out of this was not during sessions. Mm -hmm. And granted, I didn't present, which is part of that. But, mm -hmm. but yeah. But at the same time, if if we can open it up and maybe a high, I think a hybrid conference at some point, where you have the option to go. But we do open it up a little bit more to the telecommunication stuff, and yeah, particularly like with streaming certain panels. Yeah. Or um, which is, but that's an expensive proposition on its own. To do it, in terms of the the amount of space needed to stream stuff and then the people to run all that equipment not um, necessarily um streaming i i'm familiar with streaming in uh in other aspects um but with the, the bandwidth internet. of getting because because it wouldn't just be the cha yeah if you're doing congress streaming and you want to in theory do all yeah. the panels the amount of bandwidth that, that would take I guess if you're doing it simultaneously, yeah, right. that would be the, the issue. But, I mean, like, equipment-wise and, and everything, it would be easy to set up. It would be the bandwidth that's an issue. And, I mean, someone who's more technologically uh, aware could perhaps comment on that at some point. But yeah. it's um, – I don't think it's that unfeasible. It would be tough. I, I think it would be tough to do the whole thing. No, but, I mean, it, it would be, but you could first introduce, like, select panels – Right, but then, but you know, but you know, it's going to happen. Is you select one, and then the one that's not selected, there's going to be arguments over like which one you select, and if you don't select the specific one, there's going to be accusations of bias and mm -hmm. the whole thing. And and although I mean, I guess we did record some of the sessions, but and I think that's a step in the way. But because we can't do it live, or I shouldn't say we can't do it live, we don't do it live. Is is that the act of participation then comes later and. Mm -hmm. if people who are going to listen to it later but it, but that's it, still that's still a really interesting thing like recording them and maybe at some point even videotaping them to get the visual presentation yeah. parts in and then putting them i don't know on youtube or something later so that yeah. people I think can participate and i mean for grad students that would be super because if they can't come to a conference or maybe they're not ready to come to a conference yet they can still see what it's all about and that would really aid in their preparation mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's sort of the ultimate goal of what our YouTube channel is supposed yeah. to be here, is to eventually move it into video. And we've we've had a few videos. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim Clifford has done a couple at Saskatchewan, and they've been really good. And or even with us, some some of the YouTube stuff, we're trying to sort of figure out how to migrate the U the uh, PowerPoint presentations into YouTube and sync them. So even though you don't have the visual of the person speaking, you at least have their visual aid. And it's mm -hmm. synced with their talk. So whatever slide was up on the screen at that moment, the YouTube video will sort of follow along. So when in the presentation it's switched, it'll switch in the YouTube video too. Mm -hmm. So we're working towards getting that as well and have a little more interaction. And But again, the problem then is that because we're not doing it live, you know, the feedback will be later, right? So, so mm -hmm. you know, if, if it's not posted until a month later... You've had a month of maybe work on it already, and then you have more feedback. Which, but I guess it speaks to this overall issue that I mean, is our work ever done? And and somebody at the Burks last week said, research is never having to admit you're finished. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's sort of just part of what we do. But it, it's an interesting dynamic, and I'm curious to see how these things evolve, and how we try to increasingly in incorporate the ability to have the content spread widely through the internet, but at the same time still compel people to show up mm -hmm. and actively participate. And I think that's an interesting dynamic that's going to play out over the next 10, 20, 30 years mm -hmm. as we move forward. But short term, next year it's in Ottawa, Ontario, so we don't have to go anywhere for it. Although you don't live in Ottawa, Aaron, so no. you're going to have to commute in you're if right you choose to go, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. which would be a difficult experience for you. But you can, always sleep, you can always sleep on the, the couch. I mean, it's a far trek. It's a dangerous trek as well. It really is. It is. It is. You're taking your life in your hands. I am. Every time I yeah. head downtown. That's right. Yeah. 
But we are looking forward to it, and we're looking for. I, I'll speak for on behalf of the entire University of Ottawa and say that we're looking forward to hosting everybody next year in Ottawa for Congress. And uh, hopefully, we'll do another recap. Hopefully, the show will still be a thing uh, for another year because this is really two years since we started doing the show, and I'm excited that we we still do it. So, Madeline Klosky, Aaron Boys, thank you very much for doing thank this. You. I'd also like to thank Jonathan McQuarrie for his contribution to this particular episode. If you want to contact the show, the email is historyslam at gmail.com. Twitter is at Dr. Shawnee Fever. And if you're out and you see Enrico Palazzo, please say hi for me. Good job by you. Thanks for listening to the History Slam podcast. Be sure to check out Active History for more features, articles, and be sure to subscribe on iTunes.